Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Jan Sveinar. I'm the Richard N. Gardner Professor of Economics and International Affairs at Columbia University and also the Director of the Center on Global Economic Governance uh, here at CIPA at Columbia. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the annual Ambassador Donald and Vera Blinken Lecture. This lecture, as many of you know, is organized each year by the Center on Global Economic Governance. It brings a remarkable speaker to SIPA to discuss public and foreign policy issues, often with a European focus. Uh, by offering a forum for these types of conversation, the Center on Global Economic Governance aims to foster a more complete and nuanced understanding of today's complex world and many developing trends in the global, political, social, and economic environments with the aim of developing in-depth research and external policy proposals that will enhance our understanding of pressing global issues and shape political debate and policy implementation. It is a pleasure to recognize Ambassador Donald and Vera Blinken for their generosity in endowing this lecture and for their support of Colombia, SIPA, and the Center on Global Economic Governance. Ambassador Blinken is known to many of you, he has made a lasting impact in the fields ranging from public service, serving as US ambassador to Hungary from 1994 to 1998, to investment banking, to education, and arts patronage throughout his estimable career. He was awarded the US Department of Defense Award for Distinguished Public Service, as well as being the first US ambassador to receive the Republic of Hungary highest civilian honor. Vera Blinken has served on the executive committee of the International Rescue Committee. In 2002, for services to the Hungarian people, she was awarded the Middle Cross of the Republic of Hungary. Now, through the years, uh, we have welcomed many distinguished individuals to give this lecture, including recently the former US representative, Jane Harman, and the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. Uh, so we're ex excited to continue this tradition by welcoming today Ambassador Anthony Gardner to speak to us. The topic of his lecture is why US-EU cooperation is more important now than ever. Ambassador Gardner is uniquely equipped to address this subject given his vast experience in diplomatic, government, and business fields. It is also quite meaningful for Ambassador Gardner to give this year's Blinken Lecture. In the fall, I was honored to become the founding professor of the Richard N. Gardner Chair Professorship in honor of the remarkable legacy of Ambassador Gardner's late father, Richard Gardner, a revered law professor, scholar, foreign policy advisor, and diplomat who shaped many generations of Columbia students in their work in international law and foreign policy and commitment to public service. So we are grateful to have Anthony Gardner with us. Ambassador Gardner is a managing partner in Brookfield's private equity group. He's responsible for investments origination, analysis, and execution in Europe. He previously served as US ambassador to the European Union spent several years on the leadership team of Parliament Capital Partners and in the leverage finance and merger and acquisition groups of Bank of America and GE Capital, respectively. He has also worked in international law firms in London, Paris, New York, and Brussels. Ambassador Gardner holds a Master of Finance degree from London Business School, a Juris Doctor degree from Columbia Law School, Master of Philosophy degree from Oxford University and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard University. And he is the author of Stars, Stars and Stripes, The Essential Partnership Between the United States and the European Union, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2020. Thank you very much, Tony, for being with us today to explore the past and the future of transatlantic relationships and the opportunities and challenges to making progress uh, on today's most pressing issues, particularly in the context of the Russian war and crisis in Ukraine, and in 
examination of the national, regional, and global responses to ever-increasing and complex threats. We look forward to your talk, and it is my pleasure to hand the baton over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Svenar, for that very kind introduction. And I'm very pleased uh, that you are the inaugural holder of the Gardner Chair at SIPA. It is an honor to deliver this year's Blinken Lecture, an honor because I'm well aware of those who preceded me, uh, but also because of the admiration I have for Donald and Vera Blinken and the terrific job that they did in Budapest as co-ambassadors to Hungary. Today, I'd like to speak about why the Ukraine crisis has made it so clear that multifaceted US-European bonds are more relevant than ever before. Suddenly, Washington's focus is not predominantly on finding Asian allies and military solutions to the Chinese threat. I'm a believer in the importance of the EU, but I'm also aware of its shortcomings. My first job was actually with the European Commission in 1990. I later served as director of EU affairs in the National Security Council under President Clinton, and then uh, I had this wonderful opportunity to be a U.S. ambassador to the EU under the Obama second term. The book I wrote, which is you very kindly mentioned, uh, describes in greater detail some of the points I wanted to make. In Europe, um, uh, President Obama is still known for his pivot to Asia. Uh, it was a very pro-European administration that strongly supported a more integrated EU. I tried to play a small part in promoting U.S. partnership with the EU in many areas, including in trade, the digital economy, data privacy, law enforcement, sanctions, military security issues, climate change, foreign aid, humanitarian assistance. But there were skeptics at the highest levels of the administration as well. Some key officials found the EU profoundly irritating, slow, cumbersome. Many focus too much on its limited relevance in the sphere of hard security and too little on its enormous relevance as an influential partner in areas that touch on significant US interests. I was well accustomed to this skepticism when I arrived at the National Security Council in 1994 and declared that I wanted to focus on the EU. My boss at the time declared, that's great. There's no one else in this building cares about that stuff. While that view improved over the subsequent decades, the EU remains misunderstood. During my time in Brussels, I witnessed how the US and the EU successfully led efforts to combat climate change that resulted in the Paris Climate Agreement. I witnessed how they successfully handled the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa in 2015. I witnessed the important transatlantic cooperation in dealing with a series of terrible terrorist attacks in Paris, Brussels, and elsewhere. And that cooperation, by the way, wasn't just bilateral between uh, capitals, it was between Washington and Europol, the EU's agency to deal with serious crime. And one of the best examples of transatlantic cooperation I witnessed during my time in Brussels was the imposition and regular renewal of sanctions against Russia, again, uh, after its invasion of Crimea in 2014. And that's what I want to focus on for a minute. Um, and similarly, by the way, there was no way that Iran would have gone to the negotiating table to restrict its nuclear activities had it not been for very significant sanctions driven by the U.S. and Europe. The sanctions the U.S., the EU, and its allies have been implementing in, 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 against Russia in this crisis go far beyond what we did eight years ago in their breadth, in their speed, in their effectiveness. My impression is that the EU's actions have astonished uh, some officials in the Biden administration. And that astonishment is timely because it has reinforced the transatlantic bond after the wreckage of the Trump years. I'm a very strong supporter of this administration. I, I campaigned from the very first days with the president. I was fortunate enough to chair the campaign's EU working group. And many of the top officials are dear friends, above all, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, who is doing a magnificent job. The start of the campaign filled me with great hope um, started the administration, sorry, filled me with great hope that the campaign's detailed plans for improving transatlantic relations uh, were bearing fruit. And then came the uh, Afghan pullout and the unfortunate tensions over the US, UK, Australian submarine deal. I don't want to dwell on those events, but some observers got the impression that important decisions were being taken in Washington by those handling the China file with insufficient regard for European allies. It seemed to some observers that the China team at the White House was driving the policy bus. 
That team's view appeared to be that the US must leave Afghanistan quickly to focus on China, that the US is far better off focusing on Asian allies like Australia, like Japan, Korea, in some cases, India, rather than on Europe when seeking to counterbalance China's growing power. And even when seeking to establish global rules on technology and the digital economy. Why bother after all with a weak divided and declining Europe? Well, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has made it clear that Europe's relevance has been underestimated again. It's certainly helpful in this crisis that many of the key officials in the Biden administration played a leading role in the 2014 Crimea crisis. And I recall the frustration of then Vice President Biden and then Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken with a slow and painfully gradual nature of the sanctions that were applied at that time. It took six months for the US and the EU to move beyond pinprick uh, sanctions, largely travel bans and asset freezes on a few officials and members of Putin's inner circle. It was only after the downing of the Malaysian air aircraft in July 2014 with the loss of many European lives that we finally applied sectoral economic sanctions, including on the energy and financial services sectors. Now, there's no doubt that the collapse of oil and gas prices on world markets hurt Putin more than the sanctions we applied. I have little doubt that those sanctions did impose a high cost. The problem is that the cost was not high enough. Russia continued to have access to Western technology. Foreign energy companies continued to invest in Russian energy projects. Russian companies continued to have access to Western capital markets. Moreover, President Obama repeatedly insisted that the sanctions be gradual, start from a low base, giving Putin plenty of opportunity to find a face-saving exit, despite repeated evidence that Putin would ignore this. And President Obama, as we know, repeatedly blocked any proposals to provide lethal arms to the Ukrainians. That is one reason, in my view, Putin miscalculated in thinking that a full-scale invasion of Ukraine would not cripple Russia. One key success from the 2014 crisis, an important lesson for today's crisis, is that transatlantic unity must hold. We had active debates about how far and how fast to move. We disagreed at times about which sectors to hit because the relative exposures of the US and European economies to Russia are naturally different. Despite those disagreements, the US and Europe always remembered the Zulu adage. If you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And in order for sanctions to succeed, they must be broad including not only the US and EU, but also major economies such as Japan, Korea, Canada, and financial centers such as Switzerland. Had we failed to maintain transatlantic unity while moving independently on sanctions, uh, we would have scored an own goal and handed Putin a significant victory. And the same holds true today. Now, this crisis is of an entirely different magnitude from the one in 2014. The Russian invasion is not only an effort to erase an independent and democratic U Ukraine from the map, it's an effort to rewrite the entire post-war order and potentially to undermine the stability of the, Bal of the Baltic states and Central and Eastern Europe. Russia's actions uh, have therefore justified vastly enhanced sanctions. The United States is leading the way in providing substantial military, financial, and technical assistance to Ukraine. European member states in the EU have also risen to meet this historic challenge in a way that few would have imagined. Think of this, Germany has discarded decades of foreign policy to provide significant lethal aid to Ukraine and to meet swiftly its obligations as a member of NATO to spend 2% of its GDP on defense. Britain, Baltic states, and some countries in Central and Eastern Europe have transferred large quantities of military aid as well. And in a historically unprecedented move, the EU has provided Ukraine with significant funds to purchase arms and other aid. The US uh, and the EU have taken many measures that they did not dare to take in 2014, such as seizing roughly half of Russia's $600 billion stash in foreign exchange reserves. Russia had moved most of those reserves out of dollars into euros held in France and Germany and significant amounts were also held in sterling and yen. The EU's foreign minister has publicly called for Russia's frozen foreign exchange assets to be used 
to pay for Ukrainian reconstruction, just as Afghan frozen foreign exchange assets may be used to compensate the victims of the Taliban. This is extraordinary stuff. Together with the EU, the United States has also blacklisted many key Russian banks and cut them off from the SWIFT financial messaging system, sanctioned the Russian Central Bank and Sovereign Wealth Fund, cut off trans technology transfers in critical areas such as semiconductors, and seized substantial assets of oligarchs. Beijing is keenly watching the impact of our sanctions on Russia and drawing lessons to prepare for a possible move on Taiwan. It is no doubt making plans to protect its $3 trillion foreign exchange holdings and push ahead with an alternative to SWIFT, a digital currency, and greater use of the renminbi to decrease its exposure to the power of the US dollar, euro, and the Western financial system. Beijing has no doubt noted the contributions of Europe to the speed and depth of the sanctions. And Beijing has also no doubt noticed a dramatic sea change in the EU's general approach to China from relatively welcoming to far more skeptical and hence far more aligned with the United States. Europe is now the geopolitical swing vote in convincing China that its choice of partnership with Russia does not serve its interests. Putin and Xi can pretend to be best friends, but the reality is that Russia buys just 2% of China's exports. The United States likes underdogs, the Chinese like winners, and Russia is looking more and more like a loser demographically, economically, and now, at least so far, militarily. Not only has the EU shelved plans to, fi to finalize an investment agreement with China, it has proposed a raft of legislative proposals that are principally aimed at China. Uh, these include a so-called anti-coercion instrument that would enable EU retaliation against discriminatory import duties or intentional delays or refusals to provide authorizations to do business. The EU measures also include a so-called international procurement instrument that would require a bidder in EU public procurement contracts to disclose receipt of foreign government subsidies, highly relevant in the case of China. It's in the area of energy that Europe's role in Ukraine's crisis will be most important because Europe has been Russia's largest consumer of gas and oil exports. Those exports account for about half of Russia's total exports and contributed to around 40% of Russia's budget revenues last year. So it's self-evident that defeating Russia will require significantly reducing its earnings from those exports. The task is made harder by the fact that prices have spiked in part because of the invasion. This is not gonna be easy. There are difficult debates ahead, no doubt, among the EU 27. Some have allowed their energy infrastructure to be tightly integrated with and almost totally dependent on Russia. Some member states like Hungary never miss an opportunity to exploit the crisis to achieve maximum advantage. But other member states are not blameless. Already in 2014, we knew what needed to be done to reduce Europe's energy vulnerability. We discussed the topic repeatedly at meetings of the US EU Energy Council. Some measures were taken to be fair under the European Commission's leadership to improve the freer flow of gas within Europe, not just east to west, but not enough was done to build the necessary infrastructure in the subsequent eight years. It was clear back in 2014 that Europe's spare liquefied natural gas import ca capacity remains concentrated on the Iberian Peninsula with poor connections to the rest of Europe. Germany knew that it should build its first LNG terminal to allow for shipments of non-Russian gas, just as Lithuania had done. But the first is only expected to enter operations by 2024, at the earliest, a decade after Russians, Russia's invasion of Crimea. Russia provides more than 40% of the EU's gas and coal imports and a quarter of its crude oil. Some EU member states have been nearly totally reliant on Russian pipe gas, and yet projects like the Southern Corridor to import non-Russian gas into Europe have been repeatedly delayed. Several EU countries should have been very concerned in 2014 about Russian control of gas storage in Europe, and yet they allowed Gazprom to have influence. Over almost one third of all gas storage in Germany, Austria, and the Netherlands, enabling Gazprom to keep storage artificially low, squeeze supplies, and jack up prices. There were also other bad decisions, including shutting down Europe's nuclear reactors in most member states. 
Germany proceeded too long with the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline now terminated that would have resulted in greater reliance on Russian gas had it finally gone ahead. Now, why was there a failure of Europe's leadership to understand the dangers? Because it was hard politically to make the hard choices and spend taxpayer money to think about long-term energy security when one can take the easy choice and get drunk on cheap, easily available Russian energy. But Europe is now active, finally. The EU now has agreed to ban around 75% of Russian oil imports. The embargo covers uh, Russian oil brought by sea with a temporary exemption uh, for imports delivered by pipeline. The UK and the EU have agreed a coordinated ban on insuring ships carrying Russian oil, which is highly significant. The EU has set forth a clear objective to phase out all imports of Russian crude and refined products by the end of the year and to reach independence from Russian gas before the end of the decade. Europe has discovered the price of energy dependence, and as it becomes more energy self-sufficient, it will become an even better ally of the United States. As I mentioned at the beginning of our, my remarks, the US government officials too often dismiss the EU because it is a minnow in the security field, aside from sanctions. That view is distorted for many reasons, including because it ignores the EU's role as a trade and regulatory superpower. Yes, superpower. The immense importance of Europe's single market gives the EU weight in trade negotiations, in WTO reform, and allows to do export its standards and even its values around the world, not just to countries that are aspiring members, but globally, as companies will often adopt EU standards rather than adopt multiple standards or less restrictive ones. That's what's called the Brussels effect, and it has an impact on how billions of people, including in the United States, go about their daily lives. That Brussels effect determines such things as the labeling of foods and chemicals, as well as the privacy settings on websites and apps. With the recent passage of two critical um, pieces of EU legislation, the Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act, the EU shows that it will continue to be a path setter in the regulation of digital platforms, especially the giant ones in the US, such as Apple and Google. In many cases, the EU has been a thought leader on digital regulations. That's not only the case because of the famous general data protection regulation, first dismissed, by the way, as overly intrusive by men, many US digital giants before being welcomed as the global gold standard. Because the US has essentially been absent in many areas of digital regulation, the EU has been the de facto regulator of Silicon Valley. And that's why many US companies have flocked to Brussels to litigate their complaints with their US rivals. Brussels can set rules for the world because of the size of its internal market and because it often exercises a first mover advantage in setting strict standards. Rather than make products and services that meet multiple standards, many companies will typically choose to adopt the EU ones. And that is the same effect that you see that California also has in the United States because it sets stringent consumer and environmental regulations often for the entire country. That's real power, especially in our world that's increasingly shaped by the digital economy. Determining who writes the rules for the global economy will be a major determinant of power. If we don't do it together, the US and the EU, then in the not too distant future, we will be talking about a Beijing effect, the setting of global rules by China. And there's no doubt that is precisely what Beijing has in mind. The US and the EU have woken up to the Chinese government standardization plan as identified in the China Standards 2035 document. That plan states clearly China's ambitions to write the world standards in key areas. China does not want to be the net, uh, net recipient of licensing. It did, sorry, it doesn't only want to be a net recipient of licensing fees. It also wants to set standards for the technologies of the future, including 5G, 6G, autonomous vehicles, facial recognition, video surveillance, robotics, uh, and artificial intelligence. China's already named heads of some key standard setting bodies, uh, such as the uh, International Tele Telecommunications Union, the International Electrotechnical Commission, International Standards Organization, all of which do, well, fairly boring things, but very important things. Chinese officials offer business deals under the table to 
foreign companies exchange for their votes on Chinese technical proposals. The increasing ability of China to set standards for chunks of the globe matters not only because those standards entrench advantages for Chinese firms, exports of Chinese equipment may also come attached with the power of the Chinese state to compel firms to hand over sensitive information. And Chinese standards also means Chinese values in areas where human liberties are at stake, especially when personal sensitive information is being collected. Now that brings me to trade because it's also through trade agreements that the US and the EU can get countries to change their standards involving in areas such as labor rights, intellectual properties, uh, and environmental protection. Perhaps my biggest regret from my time in Brussels was our inability to conclude a US-EU free trade agreement, known at that time as the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership Agreement. That agreement was not just about reducing tariffs, although that in itself would have been significant, it was about aligning transatlantic standards at a high level of protection for our citizens. So what's the result of that failure? The EU and Canada cut a free trade deal that enshrines benefits for Canadian exports to the EU market and EU exporters to Canada. And the EU has also struck further deals uh, with Japan and Singapore that have similar effects. Negotiations between the EU and Australia and New Zealand and Mercosur continue. Now, how can the US advance its interests if it stays on the sidelines? The mantra of this administration has been to promote a foreign policy for the middle class, including on trade. But what that means in practice is a refusal to promote any free trade agreements, including with its closest partners, out of fear that Congress and US labor interests will object and out of fear that any trade liberalization will worsen the midterm election results. The Biden administration is strengthened by American policies that require certain products to be made substantially in the US. It's left untouched the Trump administration's phase one trade deal with China. It doesn't seem too eager to reform the WTO or to ensure that its dispute settlement body works. And in my view, that's a shame, as there is no doubt that China's entry into the WTO urgently requires substantive reforms that only the US and the EU working together can carry out. Now, no doubt, there have been some very important steps forward to improve transatlantic trade relations. I'm thinking here of the deal to temporarily resolve the 17-year dispute over subsidies to Airbus and Boeing, uh, and both sides, the US and EU reached an agreement over steel and aluminum, which was great, uh, over common concerns about Chinese overcapacity. But this administration has not sought to press ahead with all or even parts of the prior US-EU free trade agreement. Under President Obama, the US did conclude negotiations for an ambitious transatlantic partnership agreement in Asia only to walk away when it was clear that Congress wouldn't approve it. The other signatories promptly went ahead anyway, although they diluted some of the key provisions the US considers critical. And now China wants to join the agreement, as does Taiwan. The longer we stay out, the longer others will be writing the rules that benefit their exporters. And that surely means that the US middle class will lose out. Now, the Biden administration has announced an Indo-Pacific economic framework to address concerns that the US has no Asian trade policy. But that framework consists so far largely of general objectives and wish lists, uh, mostly devoid of specifics that may change. Not requiring congressional approval, it could easily be ripped up by a future president. The framework makes no offer of market access for Asian countries, the key carrot, after all, to drive the export of rules. ASEAN countries do double the trade with China as they do with the US, and the Chinese can trade market opening from a very low base. So I would say this to those who focus on the Chinese military threat and on the need for Asian allies to join in a security partnership with the United States, the military component of our China strategy that focuses on regional partners has to be balanced with an economic and trade policy that includes measures we can take with the European Union. And that includes reforming the WTO. The US-EU Trade and Technology Council may prove a key vehicle for US-EU cooperation. That council includes important discussions on supply chain security, export controls, investment screening, and cooperation on standards that I mentioned before. It's vital that this council avoids the fate of similar talking shops in the past, 
and delivers concrete outcomes. The US and the EU will need to work fast to ensure that together they can protect their leadership in industries of the future, including semiconductors, and ensure that they're not overly reliant on China for critical raw material inputs. So, so much is at stake and there's so little time. The tragedy in Ukraine makes clear once again that the US and the EU are natural partners. Even those in Europe calling for greater European strategic autonomy recognize that the transatlantic bond is paramount. A short time ago, it seemed that democracies were in terminal decline and that autocracies were gaining ground all over the world because they were proving more effective at responding to challenges people care about. Well, a million deaths from COVID and an attempted insurrection in the United States, as well as the choice of voters to elect populists in many elections seem to indicate serious democratic rot. But then came significant missteps in China in dealing with COVID, a criminal war launched by Russia and signs of mismanagement by many populists. So since 2020, authoritarian states have given the world disease, war, and now hunger. Democracies now don't seem to be so bad in comparison. Because of its wealth and uh, power and dynamism, the United States has the enormous privilege of leading the fight to ensure that democratic values remain relevant. The Financial Times put it well, I thought recently, and I'm quoting, for the first time since the end of the Cold War, we have a glimpse of what an alternative to a US-led world might look like. An autocratic axis in which strong men support or at least overlook each other's depredations is more than theoretical now." End quote. A US-led world doesn't look so bad anymore, but the US needs allies, especially in Europe. Security partnerships in Asia are naturally important, but let's not underestimate the role of economic and trade tools, nor underestimate the contribution of Europe in shaping the future we want. So thanks very much for your attention. Professor Sveinar, back to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Gardner. It has been a terrific, very insightful lecture. Uh, indeed, terrific food for thought on uh, all counts. And uh, Maybe I'll take the privilege of the chair to start the discussion. We have some questions coming in. Um, you know, I'm thinking that this is incredible when you think that uh, Europe and US together still account for well over 40% of the world GDP. So it is a powerful alliance. And then you add, of course, Australia and other countries that are allies as well. You know, we're getting to um, essentially account for 50% close to percent of what's happening in the world. So it's a power that is amazing. And uh, the big question is, um, given what you've given us as a history and account of what's happening now, uh, how likely do you think that the strength of determination of keeping the sanctions and really dealing even more broadly with uh, rogue authoritarian regimes will remain? Because that's really crucial, right? And maybe a second uh, question related to it is, uh, what is the danger of an alliance being formed between say Russia and China and possibly others? I think that you've uh, uh, shown very convincingly that uh, it's in China's interest to uh, keep the market, which the EU and US and other allies represent. Uh, on the other hand, it is uh, true that China needs natural resources, which Russia, Russia is now trying to place, of course, and that China now better than, say, 30 years ago, is able to provide Russia with advanced technology, which um, it has been developing and in part uh, uh, acquiring. Um, so uh, do you think that uh, the fight is uh, for us to win, and will we do it? Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, simple questions, right? Um, <laughs> look, the rubber has hit the road, no doubt about it, in the sixth sanctions package just passed. And I say that because the uh, decision that was just taken was a historic decision, imagine. Who would have thought, yeah, that even a few weeks or month, months ago that the EU would take that decision to basically cut off um, 
Russian oil, 75% Russian oil, making some exceptions, of course, we know why, because of Hungary and some other states that were very vulnerable for historic reasons. They can't be just, can't just shut it off, um, but that's historic. But there are signs of cracks, no doubt. There are signs of cracks. And then I mentioned it's not just Hungary, it's others who are concerned and it'll have an impact on a European economy that hasn't fully recovered from the pandemic. Um, so it will be a struggle. I think would be my answer, it's gonna be a struggle. And I think um, the statements were made at the council meeting. Heads of state said, this is probably the end of the road in terms of energy uh, measures, in terms of sanctions, it's hard to, see much, much more that, they, that can be done in terms of, uh, in terms of energy. Uh, and it will take time. I, I hinted that some of these things are gonna take years. You know, a lot, all these things need to be done from infrastructure to alternative uh, routes. Um, that stuff doesn't happen overnight. You know, these LNG terminals take years and they cost billions um, and, and finishing the Southern Corridor will take, will take years. Um, but so far, so good. And I do see some, you know, historic changes. It reminds me of um, what some people have called the ketchup theory of history, where you shake the bottle of ketchup and nothing happens until suddenly it all comes out. And this is kind of what's happening right now. There's been such a sea change in the perception um, of Russia and also a sea change in perception of China. And you mentioned secondly, so this alliance, fascinating to watch. I'm just, you know, reading the press. You know, I have no you know, uh, confidential information that I can draw on here, but um, there are clearly limits, clearly limits to what the Chinese are gonna do to help out uh, the Russians. And I think they've been very surprised uh, at uh, the failure, at least initially, uh, of the Russian military operations. But they're also highly concerned about losing access to the markets, which is of huge, of huge interest to them. And I mentioned some of the figures here that how Europe dwarfs the importance uh, of Russia in terms of China. Now, I think what's gonna happen here, this is not terribly original as, 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 um, as a thought, is that Russia will become a supplicant. Now, China will may, may like that. It'll be a supplicant to, 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 to China. Uh, it will sell it at energy, but it, it will be more and more reliant uh, on, uh, on China than the other way around. Um, so limits to the partnership for sure. And I, I think the Chinese are fundamentally pragmatic at the end of the day. Um, and we've seen that they're not overtly breaking sanctions. They haven't provided, at least from the information I've seen, military aid and their companies are not breaking our sanctions. So clear limits. Yep. Very good. Well, we have some questions coming in from the uh, audience. Uh, so one uh, is uh, asking whether France and Germany, in fact, have somewhat uh, different views, say, from some of the other European countries in the sense that they uh, clearly are supporting the sanctions being key players in it. But on the other hand, may be somewhat less convinced that uh, Ukraine uh, should win the war because uh, uh, that would be such a change of uh, architecture that uh, they may not want it. So this uh, uh, person in the audience is asking whether you feel that uh, France and Germany are somewhat different from other allies in Europe in this respect. Well, my, my sense is that both want Ukraine to win this war. And I don't have any, I don't believe that they are, are pushing for um, territorial concessions, for example. Um, yes, you know, a lot of phone calls have been made, highly criticized, but actually, you know, I think it's a bit unfair. I think many of these intercessions or phone calls are, uh, not, are welcomed uh, by, by Kiev. Um, so I, I don't see them pushing for uh, Ukraine to basically, um, you know, to, to give up on its, uh, on its uh, intention to remain as a whole sovereign free state. But Germany clearly is a separate is, is a separate issue uh, for historical reasons we all know don't bear repeating. Uh, I think it, it's underestimated just how far Germany has gone uh, in in departing from, as I mentioned in my remarks, decades of policies. The Ostpolitik is arguably now in tatters, right? Uh, the idea that Germany could somehow have a a different, a special relationship with Moscow clearly is 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 in tatters. Uh, the impact on German businesses uh, in Russia, huge investors in Russia have had a large, significant impact 
um, and obviously a large impact on um, the German industrial structure because of its reliance on gas. So all of those things make Russia, it might make Germany, excuse me, much more cautious. But I think at the end of the day, Germany and France do share the view that there has to be a successful outcome. And that successful outcome has to be that Putin fails in his objectives. Uh, so the second question that's there is um, <clears throat> stating that uh, uh, the history of sanctions is such that very often they didn't work or not fully in the sense of uh, uh, bringing about regime uh, change. And uh, uh, of course, uh, regular citizens very often suffered uh, because of the sanctions. So the question is, uh, why do you think that this time the sanctions might work? Uh, and um, and if so, you know, is it worth it in terms of the suffering of the regular people? Well, that's such an interesting question. Uh, and it's so hard to generalize. Um, it's hard to generalize because it depends what country is subject to the sanctions and what are the objectives of the sanctions and how broad are the sanctions and many other things, but those are a few. So uh, saying that sanctions could be effective against an economy the size of China is obviously a very different proposition from saying that sanctions can be effective against an economy the size of Iran or the size of Russia. Both can be much more effectively uh, shut off from the international economic system than the case of China, which is clearly impossible because we're so deeply integrated with the Chinese economy. And look, I, my, my view is that, as I mentioned briefly, um, sanctions against, China, against Iran uh, were successful to the extent that it was an, an inducement uh, for Iran to come to the negotiating table. And I think they were to some extent uh, successful in 2014. You can say, well, he, you know, Russia didn't withdraw, but I would argue that Putin would have gone further. But that's debatable. But I think he would have gone further and it sent a signal. I argued that we should have gone further. I think they are successful now although the jury is still out uh, because I think it, things, there are, it's a normal lag time before the real impact on the consumer, on inflation, on the GDP will become known. Um, but look, uh, just in terms of what will uh, Russia's growth trajectory look like, it's pretty clear that because of their reliance on oil and gas, we can really have an impact on technology transfers, their ability to do deep offshore Arctic drilling um, we've cut off their access to semiconductor chips, which, by the way, cannot be fully uh, made whole uh, from China or from other sources. So those are just two ways. I would say it depends. Uh, I mentioned you know, sanctions must be broad. Uh, if they're not broad, they're doomed to fail. And one of the things that makes these sanctions, I think, effective is that they're remarkably broad. Look, even the Swiss, even the Swiss are, are joined in here. Um, and there are many other examples uh, where uh, we've managed to, to pull together a coalition. And uh, by the way, I give full credit to this administration for, for a remarkable job and a very difficult job. I say that because I witnessed this, Jan, you know, how difficult it is not only to coordinate with 27, then 28 in those days, EU member states, but also non-EU member states. Fiendishly difficult. And the Biden administration has done a terrific job. I agree with you. My own reading as an economist is that sanctions that are incomplete don't work. Uh, if they are complete or broad, as you say, they can have a tremendous effect. So in that sense, it really hinges, hinges on that. Uh, we have another question, which is um, asking, um, uh, you know, what is Europe doing or is it doing enough uh, for this winter? so that when it gets cold and um, these measures that are being planned uh, take uh, place, uh, that it can really withstand uh, the winter that's coming up. Well, I'm sure a lot is going on in the background. I'm, I'm aware of a few things, for example, storage. You know, um, uh, I, I mentioned the gas problem having control over a significant storage capacity. I mean, this is al almost mind boggling that Europe allowed itself to be in this position because it was known. Now, the, I, I believe the European Commission has, um, has proposed, and I think the member states have agreed that um, there should be a minimum um, gas storage capacity. I, I don't know whether it's 90%, but it's a significantly higher level than uh, where it has been. 
Um, there are measures now uh, to prepare for a possible crisis in terms of rationing, you know, who gets what when to make sure there isn't a scramble. A co in other words, coordination, which is super important. We saw this in COVID, by the way, when member states start doing their own things and become uncoordinated in buying and purchasing supplies on the world market without having a coordinated European view, there's disaster strikes. So there is a lot of work being done to make sure the uh, EU operates as a whole, um, even now uh, potentially negotiating as a whole to offset, offset monopoly uh, or you know, high, high price power from Russia. Um, and also sharing uh, of those you know, from you know, more, more supplies from, from the, the Netherlands, uh, making sure there are more supplies from Algeria, in the case, particularly in the case of Italy, from Qatar, uh, from other sources. So uh, going, going to many other providers to see whether they can at least fill some of that gap. So a lot is happening. I, I agree with you. I think that uh, indeed uh, the preparation is on the way and it's uh, most likely you know, going to go well. Of course, it depends on a number of factors that will, that will happen. Well, uh, thank you very, very much. This has been uh, a rich, uh, as I said, food for thought and discussion. I'm sure this will resonate with lots of people and we'll have a number of discussions following up on your ideas and the facts that you presented. And once again, I'd like to express my gratitude and uh, feeling honored by being the inaugural professor um, in the name of your father. Well, thank you. I couldn't thank be, you very couldn't much. Be happier. Thanks to the whole community. Thank you. And thank you all of you who've come to listen to this lecture. And we'll see you for the same lecture again next year.